Hi, this is Trevor from Physics This Week. Uh, let's talk about some coupled oscillators and look at their equations of motion. This is going to be the first video in a series of about three videos talking about coupled oscillators. By the end of this one, we should be able to analyze the system using two springs, or excuse me, three springs and two masses, and we will determine the equations of motions for those masses. In this particular setup, we've got two equal masses, each with a mass m, uh, where this is on an air track to remove friction, and we've got three equivalent springs uh, that each have a spring constant of about k. If we map out their motion, there's the motion of the left-hand cart, and there's the motion of the right-hand cart. And as you saw in the picture, or in the movie, um, that's actually a fairly complicated set of things going on. There's a little bit of obvious oscillations in here, but the amplitudes um, keep changing back and forth uh, as we go. So let's look at the setup for this, and let's start from looking at the equilibrium condition, and we're going to choose our coordinates from there. So in the initial setup, the equilibrium position, all strings are pre-stretched. So this spring on this side has a relatively um, a, a shorter size than this stretched version. And because uh, everything is in equilibrium, all three have the same uh, stretch. If we look at the forces that are involved in these, in the equilibrium position, each mass has to be in equilibrium. So the forces caused by spring one are equal to F1. That's equal to the force caused by spring two um, that acts on each object, and finally F3 also has the same magnitude. If we look at it at a slightly different position, this time the forces have changed because each of the springs is pulled a little bit further or squished a little bit further. So in these non-equilibrium positions, the stretched parts have a larger force, but it's in the same direction as it was before. And in these squished parts, the forces are smaller than they were before. Of course, spring two has the same force on each side, which is not necessarily the same as it was up above. It's important to note that these forces never change direction, but the net force on a particular spring does change direction. In these stretched positions, we can call the different lengths L1, L2, and L3. And as often the case when we're talking about equilibrium, we want to measure the displacement from this equilibrium position. So we're going to define two variables, x1 and x2, and they will be the uh, displacement from each of those particular directions. So in this stretched position, we can make our lives a lot easier if we are very careful about how we measure L1, L2, and L3. Because remember, it's the stretch in these springs from their equilibrium position that's going to really be important. If we take a look at it, L1 is the original unstretched length plus the position of X1. Now, X1 can pick up a plus sign or a minus sign depending on which direction we go. As it's shown, x1 is a positive number. If the first mass is going to the other direction, x1 would go in as negative. And that's going to be true for x1 and x2 uh, throughout all of these. They're going to pick up their sign from where they are on either side of x2 equals 0 or x1 is equal to 0. L2 is probably the most complicated of them. L2 is shortened by x1, so here's our minus x1, and it's lengthened by x2, at least in this position. And again, these guys could change signs depending on where uh, the particular springs are on either side. And then L3 is going to be the original stretch length plus or minus x2, depending on which direction it's going. I'm going to write it in as negative x or as minus x2, and x2 again can pick up a positive or negative sign. So if we look at L1, in particular the change in L1, it is its original length subtracted from its new length, and that turns out to be just x1. For L2, we go through the same process. The original unstretched length is L0. We subtract that from its new length, and we get x2 minus x1. 
And finally, for L3, this guy becomes negative x2. And that negative sign is very, very important, um, just as the order here is important and the positive sign is important on this. Again, these variables are going to pick up signs depending on where they're located, but we want to treat them for now uh, in the manner that's shown here. And again, this is the stretch of the spring, which will help us determine the forces in the springs. Now let's look at the equations of motion. The forces are going to be F1 and F2 acting on M1, and they're going to be determined by spring 1 and spring 2. And F1 is always pointing in the negative direction. F2 is always pointing in the positive direction, at least on this particular object. So we can go from our vector equation to our algebra equation. We can put in the forces in each. F1 only depends on the stretch delta L1, uh, which is just x1 uh, caused by spring on spring 1. And F2 depends on x1 and x2, as we saw before, because delta L2 uh, depends on both of those. We've got our k in there. We've got these two forces combined in the proper manner. And notice now I can combine some terms. Doing a little bit of algebra, I find out that ma1 is equal to negative 2kx1 plus kx2. I can go through the exact same process on the other mass. I won't bore you with the details on this one, other than to show you that ma2 is equal to negative 2kx2 plus kx1. Okay, so these two equations look very similar, except the x1 and x2 are switched uh, in each of the two equations. I just wanted to go through the setup of this. Uh, so for a quick review, like all oscillations, it's best to measure around the equilibrium position of the oscillators. And it's the change in the length of the spring that's important. And we measure that from equilibrium using x1 and x2 as our variables. The individual forces, F1 never changes direction, but the net force uh, on each object can and does. And the equations of motion are given by these two guys, where notice that the negative 2k switches from x1 to x2, and likewise uh, for those two. So these equations look somewhat symmetric, and that's going to be useful uh, in the next presentation when we talk about how to further model the, the motion of these coupled oscillators.